Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Thank you for joining me today in this lecture, nasopharynx um, target volume delineation. Just to remind you that, uh, as we all always mention, that I mean these types of lectures are just to help my junior colleagues to to desensitize them from uh, from the fear of uh, taking the action and start to read and uh, delineate uh, uh, structures and organs and um, target volumes themselves so if you're senior and you're working in head and neck i don't think that this would be useful for you and i always remind my colleagues that your book is your reference don't ever take any information from from my lectures or from I would say from anybody, I mean, you have to read. And the more you read, the more you know. As we always say, leaders are readers and readers are leaders. Okay, so leaders are readers and readers are leaders. So we, just to uh, to help you to study the, um, the head and neck cancer in general, I'm just putting here uh, like a simple way of uh, how to study the head and neck but if you already know about it and don't don't confuse yourself it's just for someone who are who is just starting or prepare himself for the exam and he is looking for how to start uh, uh, studying the head and neck uh, tumor site i just doing it in a in a simple way so what I would suggest that you do it in a horizontal way. What I mean by horizontal, when you start, like for example, looking at the anatomy, don't look at the anatomy for the nasopharynx and then the hypopharynx and then the larynx, but look to the anatomy of the head and neck. For example, you can divide it into spaces, masticator space, um, like infertemporal fossa, pharyngeal spaces, and then you, you dig down and go to each structure within the head and neck. And in doing this, I mean, this will will give you a broader view about the anatomy of the head and neck rather than just focus on a single tumor site and you don't know exactly what's the relation uh, with the different parts of the head and neck. If you're looking at the an epidemiology and the etiology, you can put just on the like a table or uh, like a, a large uh, graph where you can put, for example, the titles on one side, for example, genetic, uh, social, environmental factors, blah, blah, blah. And then for each tumor site you can add what will be specific so for example if you say head and neck cancer we know smoking we know uh, alcohol consumption but we also know something specific for each tumor site like humor papillomavirus for the oropharynx or here in the epstein barr virus for the nasopharynx and so on so that's how you can study it and you appreciate the difference between the tumor sites the symptoms it's tumor specific yeah site specific for example the nasopharynx or the nose you can put it stacks but it's also common that for like the hypo oro and nasopharynx to present to be the first presentation with a lump in the neck so we put symptoms as lump in the neck as first uh, symptom and then signs of pain in the ear as we did in the previous lecture it's a common for many tumor sites in the head and neck so instead of just uh, uh, taking tumor side by side just do it for all together staging you will not appreciate the difference in staging between the nasopharynx and the new staging system for the human papilloma virus positive oropharyngeal carcinoma unless you look at it in a different way and do it horizontally investigations the laboratory radiological invasive laboratory is general and specific invasive uh, invasive can be general and specific in general will be the biopsy specific can be examination under anesthesia for example scope if you want um for the the blood uh, for the lab for the radiology also you can do general CT, MRI, and specific if you want to put like a, a PET CT, for example. Any any tumor site can be customized. Treatment for head and neck cancer. Don't rush and go for surgery. Head and neck, chemo, radio. Please, in the oral exam, be very meticulous and put something in your mind like a standard answers for all. So, and this is not only for for the nasopharynx or the head and neck in general. You can put it for every tumor size you can say that patient need psychological support nutritional support yeah 
and speech therapists can come here, a dietitian can come here in the head and neck. For head and neck specific, you put uh, alcohol cessation, smoking cessation. So as if you give you yourself your time to think about the proper answer for for the question by saying something like routine. If the examiner tell you, okay, okay, we know, just go directly to the active treatment, then you have to go and and do it. But I just this is something that I wanted to share with you. How would you start studying the nasopharynx? As we all know that the nasopharynx is the first. Uh, a cavity just underneath the skull base it open to the nose and there is no uh, not, nobody wouldn't know the, the nasopharynx just to mention that the caudal edge of the nasopharynx is now the is the lower border of c1 so this is a lateral view x-ray so if i want on a lateral view x-ray to give you some uh, uh, hints and tricks about it because this is a very important uh, uh, view we are using it in simulator we, you can use it in a drr and you can use it also for palliative treatment if i want to delineate the nasopharynx on such a lateral x-ray um, like for palliative treatment i still can do it just on an, a drr on an x-ray or something uh, like this uh, this image and it's very nice to understand this also because based on on the field of radiotherapy we used it in the 2d you will see that the things didn't change much we're still using the same concept or the same region in the target volume delineation of the nasopharynx for example i give you an example of this uh, skull base but before we go that through an x-ray lateral view i want to delineate where the nasopharynx will be so the, what I'm saying is that the busy occiput, busy sphenoid is forming the roof of the nasopharynx. So this is the sphenoid air sinus. How did you know? Anterior to a very important landmark in the skull base, something called the clivus bone. The clivus is a Latin word meaning a, a, a slope. So it's the sloping bone, if you want to say. It. And how did you know that this is the clivus? If you looked at the posterior clinoid, this is the pituitary fossa. I think we all know the pituitary fossa. It's easy to delineate it and it should be with the width of the tip of your little finger. If it's widened, then you see that it's so so sized so or widened, but this is not uh, our aim today. So look at the posterior clinoid. Uh, the posterior clinoid, if you go from the posterior clinoid and just look at the bone that is triangular in shape, if you see my cursor, you can see that I am as if drawing a triangle. The triangle base is here, yes, just vertical line from the posterior clinoid, and then it's in the air here, and then this is the tip of the clivus, and then backward again. So the clivus, sloping bone, triangular in shape. The clivus is a very, very important landmark. It's a landmark for the, the, the nasopharynx, because I know that underneath will be the nasopharynx, so number 12 here will be the nasopharynx, basis sphenoid, basis occiput. It forms part of the posterior roar as well as the roof of the nasopharynx, and the other part is formed by the sphenoid air sinus. The lower border or the caudal border of the nasopharynx is C1. And this is C1, please, this is C1, because it happened that uh, a colleague, he brought an atlas, an atlas, this is similar to this, and he showed number 15, and he told me, you're saying that this is C2, this is C1, but this is C2. No, this is C C1. How did I know? The 15 is the, the odontoid process of C2. C2 has an odontoid process that goes and go down like this so you can see that c2 is a quite a big bone a large bone and it extends with dense and odontoid process that goes to c1 this is the body of c1 this is the body of the atlas, which is a flat bone and then this is the posterior tubercle of c1 the lower border of c1 is coinciding with the caudal edge of or the caudal border of the nasopharynx and this is good because it was when you say that gray anatomy you say like uh, the upper border of c2 you don't know exactly where to, to say it is it here or is it there so i think by defining it at c1 is good and also c1 
is a very important landmark for posterior fossa palliative treatment for posterior fossa medulloblastoma. And if you are doing brachytherapy, you know that we used to do the brachytherapy for the nasopharynx, whether it's a boost or like a recurrent disease. And usually we take the C1 as a landmark for inclusion of the nasopharynx proper in our field of radiotherapy. So C1 is a very, very important landmark. Also a very important landmark I want you to, sh to see is this triangle. This is the pterygoid plate. If you remember with the old days of the nasopharynx, we used to to take the posterior one-third of the maxilla in the nasopharynx. Actually, the posterior one-third of the maxilla, we are taking the border of the nasopharynx, anterior border of the nasopharynx here, is to cover this particular region, something very important called the pterygopalatine fossa, and we'll go that in more details. This is maxillary ear sinus. Another important landmark I want to familiarize yourself with it is the frontal ear sinus, but this is not important. What is more important is what we call the crib reform plate. How do I define the crib reform plate? This is not the crib reform plate. Guys, this is the greater wing of sphenoid. So where is the crib reform plate? If you see the, the frontal air sinus and then you go downward with the frontal air sinus to the inferior floor, the floor of the frontal air sinus. From the floor of the frontal air sinus, just draw a horizontal line and this horizontal line will direct you to the crib reform plate. You can see it here. This is a crib reform plate and here is the ethmoid air cells and this is the sphenoid air sinus. So just by a plain x-ray like this, I can know exactly where is the sphenoid, where is the nasopharynx, and where is the other important structure and the clivus. The clivus is a landmark. At the clivus, there is the foramen magnum. So I know that the foramen magnum should be somewhere here. This is the ear and mastoid air cells. But I, I want you to familiarize yourself with this important bone, the sloping bone, the slope bone with the foramen magnum. So foramen magnum will be here because it, the clivus form the anterior border of the foramen magnum. There is a very interesting uh, uh, field of radiation we are usually we are doing it like posterior fossa radiotherapy, posterior fossa for medulloblastoma. You can do it also in 2D and then you draw it on a 3D. The reason why I'm doing this because sometimes I ask my colleague to do it like a simple two parallel opposing field for posterior fossa and he doesn't know exactly where to go. So it's very simple to do it here. And they hope you'll find it useful. And then you can go back and, and draw it on your CT and see if we are doing okay with that. So how would you draw, what's the landmark of a posterior fossa radiotherapy? The posterior fossa radiotherapy, the anterior border usually will be the posterior clinoid. Because with posterior fossa, you usually tend to include the brain stem as well. The anatomy for posterior fossa Tumor, if there is a question in the exam to telling you um, give an account on posterior fossa tumor. It was an old days actually without before the, the, the MCQs and OSCEs. They there was a, <coughs> there was a, a, a written exams and we they tell us posterior fossa. So we had to know which structure we have to take in the posterior fossa. So the brain stem is part of the posterior fossa, by the way. So if you want to exclude the brain stem, you can. But classic posterior fossa irradiation will usually include the brain stem. So the anterior border will be the posterior clinoid. The lower border will be C1. That's why we see C1 and we define it. Posterior border will be the ox occiput. There remain a problem with the upper border. There is another, there is two ways of doing the upper border. One, one is to measure it by a diagnostic CT. If you have a diagnostic CT, you can see that the, from the, 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 the foramen magnum up to the cerebellum, how much is, is the, the distance, and then you can put it on the simulator. Or there is a simple way of doing things, which is uh, uh, the highest point of the vertex. I'm sorry that it's not very clear. From the highest point of the vertex down to the foramen magnum, just draw a line. And then halfway of this line, put a mark, and this should be uh, the upper border 
or actually some would take it one centimeter from the distance between the vertex down to the foramen magnum again from the foramen magnum to the highest point of the vertex take a midpoint and then one centimeter above it this usually serve as the upper board just notice that the posterior part of, of the field if this is a square field like this you just have to remove the corner and the reason why we are removing the corner because this is occipital lobe we don't have to use the occipital lobe as we know that the uh, tinturium cerebelli usually have an attachment in the uh, in the uh, is a sloping surface sorry uh, the tinturium cerebelli is sloping from anterior to posterior so you have to protect the occipital lobe in this area and usually i draw a line from the crosshair just to draw a line then i review it on the ct i'm sorry i took a lot from this but it is something worth worth take it like try to familiarize yourself with it i mean it, it most probably you will you will you will you will you will find it very very useful a very important point as well that to mention that the cribriform plate is at a lower level uh, compared to the orbit so whenever usually we do uh, like a whole brain radiotherapy we usually take part of the globe in the blastoma or in palliative we usually take part of the globe in the field to cover this frontal region uh, properly and the last point i want to mention about this uh, x-ray film that the temporal lobe is lying lateral to the sphenoid air science so this is sphenoid air science you can see that the temporal lobe is lying there so if you are doing a parallel opposing field don't forget that here just beside the sphenoid air sinus there is normal brain tissue lying down in there so because we usually forget about that in in our uh, field of radiotherapy and that's why when we do whole brain radiotherapy i usually tell my my colleagues don't ever forget to look at your mri or ct because there may be a lesion here you will say but this is a sphenoid i'm not talking about the sphenoid i'm talking about low lying tumor in the temporal lobe so you have to take a margin from that so be generous if be generous please if you have a temporal lobe uh, metastasis and don't and this is also why this x-ray film is very useful because if you draw your your field of radiotherapy like this for example we take usually a line from the frontal ear sinus and do along the skull base and if you have a tumor lying down you may be sometimes you may compromise the coverage of this temporal lobe metastasis so please don't forget that that the temporal lobe is lying there and review your ct or mri if you're doing a brain metastasis uh, whole brain radiotherapy to make sure that you are covering it uh, properly and you're covering the meninges uh, properly in the majority of cases it should be okay but just if you have a large uh, uh, like metastasis uh, be careful please by covering it properly a last, a last important point I want to mention because I'm gonna use it now in target volume delineation is what we called it the PPF the pterygopalatine fossa I talked about the pterygopalatine fossa in the previous lecture but just here to to show you um, this is sphenoid air sinus this is the nose we are very close down there to the nasopharynx so when i come to the nasopharynx i will tell you you have to you have to cover the pterygopalatine fossa as part of your volume when we take when if you look at the guidelines it tell you take the anterior border of your volume should take the and posterior one third of the nose or posterior one third of the maxilla or take now we it's reduced to 0.5 centimeter the idea is not about only the nasal mucosa or the maxilla I have nothing to do with the maxilla and nasopharynx but by covering this properly you are making sure that you didn't miss this pterygopalatine fossa pterygopalatine fossa the roundabout of the head and neck please review the other lecture the roundabout of the head and neck and this is a very important landmark you can see it open to the intracranial middle cranial fossa through the foramen rotundum it open through the the nose through the sphenopalatine foramina it open through the infratemporal fossa with the pterygo what we call it the pterygo uh, maxillary fissure 
it opens to the now it, 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 it opens posteriorly with a very narrow canal with a median nerve there this is a pterygoid canal you can see it it can also uh, go uh, posteriorly and that's why we are talking about the apex of the petrous bone to cover this area properly and it may go even downwards to the oral cavity through the uh, what we call it the greater palatine canal or greater palatine foramina you can see also that the roof of the pterygopalatine fossa is nothing but the inferior orbital fissure just by looking at the pterygopalatine fossa you know exactly where and what you are covering and this is very very important in target volume delineation of the nasopharynx please review the pterygopalatine fossa and you'll find it also in another uh, lecture there the last thing just i mentioned this before as well that the superior uh, constrictor muscle is not reaching the the base of the skull laterally it reaches the base of the skull from posteriorly through the raphe you can see here this is a superior constrictor muscles so yes you can see and this is what we call it the sinus of morgagni i'm sure that you heard about it in your anatomy during the the medical uh, school and this form of morgagni is a defect in the pharyngeal muscle wall there is no muscle there there is only only fascia what we call it the uh, basilo uh, uh, fascia if i remember correctly and through this sinus of morgagni you will have the eustachian tube and levator villi palatini can go there which means that with the lateral wall of the nasopharynx it's easy for the tumor to spread there is no there is no uh, muscle or pharyngeal muscle there so this is again the foramen uh, the the uh, morgagni sinus if you remember the old days with the um, standard feed of radiotherapy believe me we didn't change things uh, a lot except that we tried to be more more um let's say um uh, less ex less uh, more more conform uh, more conformal and we we used to to you know with the with the two d fields um we used to be a bit generous and the, the, the I, I just want to mention that it makes no sense no make no sense at all for me that patient with 2d will be cured and then when you go to the high tech and move to imrt you get a lot of misses and a lot of uh, problems over the patients i don't think that this is something uh, fair for our patients so please be careful that most of the guidelines the they put in their mind the old days of our radiotherapy and whenever we start now and talking about i will get for you um, the